Hey guys, I'm back today, and um, in the sense of uh, attempting to, to keep this a short one, um, I decided to do a video on somebody that I think needs attention, even though I'm, all the albums I've showed, are almost all of them I've showed already, um, and that is keyboardist uh, Rainier Brunninghouse. Um, I have a couple of other artists I was going to do, but those would be very long videos. I thought Rainier Brunninghouse, even though I did mention him in my Eberhard Weber video, and most of the albums he plays on are Everhard Weber albums. I thought he still deserved his own uh, video simply because um, he's great. <laughs> what can I tell you? Um, interesting musician. Until until just a couple minutes ago, I never really thought of the association style stylistically. How do I explain um, his writing, his playing, his his concept, his oral concept of, of mixing uh, acoustic piano and synthesizers, which is something that he does beautifully. It's hard to, for me to even come up with somebody that that really can mix the acoustic piano with uh, electric electric keyboards and seem to really have a concept. And until just preparing this video, I thought kind of a likely comparison might be Lyle Mays, the American Lyle Mays, uh, Pat Metheny group keyboardist, who also did solo projects on his own. Uh, Lyle Mays is somebody that, too, is steeped in jazz, um, but he doesn't really play bebop in terms of doing his originals when he writes material. He um, has a very strong sense of the style on acoustic piano, but also appears to know exactly how and what he wants out of synthesizers. And he's got a sound. As a matter of fact, there's a, on, my, on, my, uh, on one of my sound modules, my synthesizer sound modules, there's actually a sound called Mays, M-A-Y-S, which is um, a, a standard sound that Lyle Mays tends to use a lot on one of his synthesizers. Um, and uh, Rainier Brunninghouse is very much in that same tradition. I'm sure he's, he studied jazz, but you don't hear that mainstream bebop standards kind of uh, mix in his music. And being German, I'm sure he grew up with a lot of classical music, which may even be more of an influence uh, from him. And man, he's he's a keyboardist to check out if you if you like that 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 combination of acoustic piano and somebody that uses a lot of synthesizers um, and is very lyrical and actually very approachable. Um, but you can't can't do better than him. Now the first thing that I'm aware of that he did is, and I'm going to show a lot of these records I've shown. Um, Eberhard Weber's The Colors of Chloe, which was Eberhard Weber's uh, first uh, solo disc. On ECM, December 1973, and there it is. Uh, it's Eberhard Weber's first album as a leader, and Rainier Brunninghouse is the keyboard player throughout. A lot of people, a lot of people really found that to be a very influential album. And people that aren't necessarily even hardcore uh, Eberhard Weber or even ECM fans. Um, next up, another Eberhard Weber album. And this is a real good um, example of his skills as a keyboard player. Uh, the following morning, which was recorded in August of 1976. Again, this is an Eberhard Weber album. But there is so much Rainier Brunninghouse on this, uh, because there's a cello section on this album. But there's no bass or drums, there's no rhythm section. So it's strictly cellos, Eberhard Weber on bass, playing a lot of the main melodies on bass, so there's more than one bass part in a lot of these compositions. And then Rainier Brunninghouse playing no synthesizers on this, but both electric and acoustic piano. And this is beautiful. There's one, sh the shortest track on here is Little Avant Garde, um, which is, I think, the last track on the album. Yeah. But the rest of it is very accessible, very pretty stuff. Like I said, no rhythm. Um, most of this is very much a composition, very much written out. There may be short moments where there's uh, some improvisation space, most of which is actually taken up by the bass. But it's really the, the body of the sound, the majority of the sound is really laid down by the beautiful electric and acoustic pianos of Rainier Brunninghouse. Highly recommended, even though there's no synthesizers on it. Um, so then, naturally, when Eberhard Weber decided to form his colors band, a quartet, with uh, bass drums, keyboards, and a saxophone. Uh, who did he call? Ex uh, let me see, September 75, the first album came from Eberhard Weber's Colors. 
yellow field he called Radio Burning House. Now in this one, this is slightly unusual in that um, I can only recall two albums, and I could be wrong, uh, that Radio Burning House played electric piano. One of them was the following morning that I just showed. This is another one. There's some electric piano in here. Uh, a lot, pr probably more electric piano than acoustic piano, which is a bit rare for him. Uh, but this one has the synth synthesizers in there, and excellent use of the synthesizers on the first Colors album. And uh, really, really nice. Again, he's the guy, you know, with the harmonic instrument that's laying down uh, that, that, that the majority of the, the sound bass palette that everyone's playing on top of, Charlie Mariano on saxophones, and on this case, uh, John Christensen on drums. Um, so, and Eberhard Weber on bass. Um, the keyboards are very, very important. And they do a beautiful job in here. Some of the synthesizer lines actually double or play in harmony with the Charlie Mariano saxophone in things that are obviously very written out. Very, very nice, very beautiful. Um, you can kind of hear, I'll say a dated, but certainly an early 70s synthesizer sound. I happen to love those sounds, but the synthesizer sounds will tell you when it was recorded. Their next album, done in November of 77, uh, pretty much the same lineup. Um, John Christensen, the drummer, has left. And um, again, I need to mention Maja Weber's beautiful artwork, uh, Eberhard Weber's late wife, on these albums. Um, you've got um, John Marshall replacing John Christensen on drums. And again, Rainier Bruninghouse, Charlie Mariano, and Eberhard Weber. And again, you know, there may be a little electric piano in here. I'm not sure. I think this is primarily an acoustic piano and synthesizers thing. And a lot of people uh, really uh, consider this their favorite of the, the three albums that they did as a group. But um, the synthesizers may have changed. Uh, he may have updated his equipment. I'm not hearing uh, a little bit of those dated sounds that were on the, the Yellow Fields, the, the previous album, by the group. A um, little bit more subtle now. So I think he may have been, in the late 70s was a hell of a time for a synthesizer technology too. It was changing very, very rapidly, pretty much from that point on. So he may be uh, using different uh, different synthesizers in this one. C certainly the colors are a little different of the synthesizer. Uh, they're fine. They're excellent. They're maybe more subtle and less obvious and maybe blend in better with the overall sound. But I still love the, the yellow fields. I still love those early synthesizer sounds. But they very much stand out. Uh, here it's a much more integrated sound. And you could hear probably that these are primarily European musicians, I think, on this because even though it's a quartet, it's almost orchestral at times. Uh, there's things going on that aren't the clear, oh, the bass player's doing this rhythm and the drummer's playing this rhythm, and the horn player soloing while the keyboard player lays down chords. There's more compositional sense to it. Very, very beautiful stuff. Uh, certainly is jazz in a sense. Uh, there's improvisation, there's the sophistication of the music, but um, Again, this is very approachable stuff, and this is one of those albums you know, where they just really exceeded what sounded like was capable by a standard jazz quartet. And the last one that they did together at the Hard Weber Colors, which was, uh, I want to say, 1980, but I'm looking for the July 1980 was recorded in. Again, uh, John Marshall on drums, uh, Eberhard Weber on bass, Charlie Mariano, saxophones, flutes, etc., etc., and uh, Rainier Bruninghouse again on the keyboards. Uh, not so much of a, of a change in sound on synthesizers in this one, but again, it sounds like there's different synthesizers in here. Now, the other one does go back a couple years prior, so at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't get uh, some different equipment, some more synthesizers. I'm hearing um, what may be a, a sequencer. I'm not sure if it's something that he's playing repeatedly very fast or it's a sequencer. I think it may be a sequencer, which would be the uh, really first and only time in a Everhard Weber Colors album that you hear one. And uh, the only instance uh, on an Eberhard Weber album, uh, the Colors albums, where uh, there was a track that was not written by Eberhard Weber, and Rainier Bruninghouse writes a very long track, actually the longest track on the album, called Bally, um, he was the composer of. Excellent. Excellent. And there was one disc I forgot to pull out, uh, and, and I've shown it on uh, a prior one, and that is the um, 1975 live jazz festival uh, vinyl thing that I showed that did have one track by Eberhard Weber's Colors on it. And uh, actually that, there was a track on there called Appalachian, I think it was called. 
and that is a track that was not recorded on any of the group's albums. And that one was actually, now that I think about it, uh, credited to both Eberhard Weber and Rainier Bruninghaus. And I forgot to pull the vinyl out, though it's pretty much a solid color. There's not much to see on that, that album. Uh, it's not Hamburg. I forget um, where the festival was in Germany that that track was taken from. But it's only one track, and there's other artists on the, on the other tracks on that album. But again, another Maja Weber album cover. And Rainier Bruninghaus, uh, pretty much after 1980, uh, didn't play so much in Eberhard Weber's band anymore. The band ceased to exist. And uh, all of the Eberhard Weber projects after that had a different set of musicians that were always, always changing, going from album to album. And then Eberhard Weber got into a thing for a while where he was recording solo bass albums. So there was no other musicians on there. But this came out 2007, so I'm not, I'm not sure if the concert itself was 2007 or 2006. And I just showed this one. Um, the Eberhard Weber live album, Stages of a Long Journey, which was the last thing uh, recorded before Eberhard Weber, um, uh, at least Eberhard Weber's leader, before he uh, suffered a stroke, had Rene Bruninghaus playing on some of the tracks on this. So it was nice that kind of full circle a little bit that he did return to play with Eberhard Weber. And this is more of a career spanning thing where uh, it was a concert with uh, orchestral section and a lot of um, Eberhard Weber compositions from the past revisited, redone, and in some cases rearranged as well. It's a nice album, but ag and again, Rainer Bruninghaus plays on this. And on this one, he uh, does he play? He only plays piano on this one, yeah. He doesn't play synthesizer on this one, but that may be because the, the tracks that he appears on also have orchestra on them, too, uh, picking up a lot of those colors. Nice album. Um, where am I going to go to next? Well, next, even though you had a lot of years uh, after 1980 from that 2007 release that uh, Rainier Bruninghaus didn't play with Eberhard Weber, and by the way, he played on more Eberhard Weber albums than any other musician, um, they were very closely associated, even though, as I said, Eberhard Weber did do albums without him. Um, though, and this is the first album I'm aware of, though I may be, I may be missing something from my, uh, I wouldn't say from my collection as much as from uh, the stuff that I've managed to pull out of my bins, and I think I pulled out most of the Jan Garbrick group albums that I have. 1988, Jan Garbrick um, records this album called Legend of the Seven Dreams, and until this point, until this point, uh, I know going into the mid-80s, uh, really from the late 70s to the mid-80s, John Garbrick had a group that was sometimes a quintet, usually it was a quartet, uh, and usually had guitars in it, and um, I guess maybe John Garbrick felt that had run its course, and he started taking a slightly different approach to this album. Rainier Burning House, he called up and this is the first time that I'm aware of that they played together, at least on, on album. They may have toured together prior. But on this one, um, Jan Garbrick, the saxophone player, calls up Rainier Bruninghaus to play synthesizers, piano, and uh, also Eberhard Weber, who had been playing with Jan Garbrick since 1978 already. So you've got Eberhard Weber and Rainier Bruninghaus together again, even though Bruninghaus hadn't been playing on the Eberhard Weber albums. And nice band, by the way, Nana Vasconcelos on percussion, which is a really nice, uh, nice grouping of musicians. I must say, most of this album is not, it's not really a band album where all four musicians are playing on most of the tracks. There's tracks on here that are solo, uh, Jan Garbert by himself, uh, different um, groupings. There's uh, Garbrick, Burning House, and Vasconcelos without Eberhard Weber. Uh, so there's, there's only really a few tracks that all four musicians play in, maybe, maybe two or three, I think, where the um, all four musicians play together. It's not really a band album. It's more of the, kind of the way that, that Jan Garbrick was uh, working at this time and continued to work when he made his solo albums. He had more of a concept of pieces and then would go into the studio and record a lot of the stuff himself and uh, use the musicians on the individual tracks where he thought he needed them, where he needed keyboards and stuff. So there's not a lot of, uh, really, the Rainier Burning House stuff on his albums, um, even though there's a whole boatload of albums here that, that he played on. And the next one, August 1990, once again, uh, an album called, this, I took up The Runes from 1990, 
Jan Gar another Jan Garbrick album, another Jan Garbrick album with Rainier Bruninghouse on it and Everhard Weber on it, and Nana Vasconcellos, the percussionist from the previous record also. Uh, he also used Manu Cachet, who played in his group for quite a long time as well, on drums. And um, he uses Buji Weiseltoff, I think is how you pronounce it, I'm not sure, on synthesizer. And uh, he also uses a vocalist on this. So it means, and again, this is um, the kind of thing where it's not really always clear who plays on what track necessarily. Uh, where um, actually on this one, where your burning house only plays piano, and Buji Weiseldorf plays uh, the synthesizer. So uh, you could probably figure out who plays on what track. But again, it's not the entire group playing on all these tracks. It's um, Garbrick calling in when he needs them or when he feels like this calls for this piano part here and all that. But it's certainly worth you know listening to. Um, these albums are fairly, they're, they're funny because as much as I've listened to them, and when I play them again, I, I, I remember them, but as soon as they're done playing, it's like the, the music kind of disperses into the mist, and I can't recall a single track off of there until I put it on again, and I'm like, oh, okay. There's something about, maybe it's the amount of music you recorded at this time, or it's just the nature of the wispiness of the music itself. Um, here's another one. Uh, 1993, 12 Moons is a real nice cover. Uh, again, Jan Garber group, this is credited to the Jan Garber group. So this one uh, has a, a bit more of the band appearing throughout all the tracks versus the last two, which were, there's a lot of solo Garber tracks on there where the other musicians didn't appear. But again, you got Rainier Burning House, this time credited on keyboards, which means he's playing synthesizers as well as piano. Emhard Weber's on bass. Uh, Manu Cachet on drums again. Uh, this time you have Marilyn Mazer on percussion, probably the first time he recorded with her, and two vocalists. He got into this vocal chant thing for a while that he would use, usually female um, vocalists, to carry through, but, but, which appears only on a couple tracks. But um, nice band. Nice band. Good good album from what, from what I remember. I'll end up playing these after the video's done. This is what I always do. And uh, again, you've got Rainier Burning House. I think there's a little bit more of him on that album, simply because it was more of a, a bit of a, a concept piece. Um, Visible World. Oh, I gotta try to pull this thing out. Well, I'll show you what I do, guys. Sometimes for my own reference, when there's a lot of musicians on an album, and I'm trying to figure out who plays what on each track, I actually make a note and I stick it in the in the in the record. But here's one from '95, which is quite a long album. It's about 70 minutes. No, 75 minutes. Um, called Visible World. There's a lot. There's a lot of musicians on this one, and a lot of them only appear on a couple tracks. And what I do a lot of times is I've made these, and probably read some of it, and get it out of the glare. What I put in uh, as far as trying to figure out who's playing what where. So you can see Marilyn Mazer is playing various percussion instruments on certain tracks. Manu Cachet playing on certain tracks. Uh, Rainy Bruninghouse mostly playing. Uh, piano on five of the album's tracks, and Synthesizer on one of the album's tracks, and Everhard Weber playing on six of the album's tracks. Uh, so and then, again, there's, there's uh, Trelock Urtu making a guest appearance on uh, one track, it looks like, and a vocalist, again, who's still doing the vocalist thing in there. And I kind of make those for my own reference sometimes, because it's uh, it gets frustrating, sometimes trying to figure out who's doing what where. Um, but it's a nice, again, it's a nice band. And I wouldn't need to do that unless there was, in some cases, if there's more than, if there's only one percussionist on an album, you know when you hear percussion, they must be playing it. In this case, you've got, you've got a couple different, you've got three, technically three different percussionists. Uh, so I like to spread out who does what where. And because Jan Garbrick himself is playing some of the electric keyboards, uh, I, I put those notes in there so I can figure out, well, is that, is that Garbrick playing it or is it Rainy Burning House playing it? I remember this is this is another another good album. Seventy five minutes, long album. He's, he's doing long albums around this time, and a double album set, which oddly enough is only about ninety or ninety five minutes long, um, is called Rights. It's a double disc, but um, considering his single disc were running about seventy five minutes, it's not that much more music than you get in a standard disc. And again, uh, this is a, an album where he used a. The, the Bougie Weiseltoff uh, on synthesizer, uh, Marilyn Mazer on percussion, 
Eberhard Weber on bass, and Rudy Brunninghaus on keyboards. And there's another musician there whose name I won't even try to pronounce. And I'm not even sure what instrument they play. Uh, I think it might be vocalist, though. Uh, this is a double disc set. Um, again, uh, again, there's not a lot of... Uh, this, is, this is one of those situations where there's a few musicians that play in one track, and there's, there's some Jan Garbrick solo tracks, I'm pretty sure. And um, so he pretty much calls again as needed. And I know uh, Buzi Weiseltoff plays a lot of synthesizer on this, and there's probably not quite as much in your Bruning House. And in fact, the Bruning House is probably uh, exclusively playing piano. And I would pull, I would pull it out, but it's a double disc set. I said, well, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway and let you be bored to death just to see if there's, in fact, any. In, you know, there's a whole big booklet in here, but. There's a lot of pictures of musicians in the booklet and not a lot of uh, information necessarily. See, it, it, it's uh, crediting Rainier Burning House just as keyboard, and I don't know what that means. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of generic, but I know Bougie Weiseltoff is strictly pretty much a synthesizer player. So I don't know if keyboard in his definition means um, piano or whether or not um, Burning House is actually on certain tracks anyway, playing all the keyboards, which would include acoustic piano and synthesizer. Interesting album. And now the last, I think this is the most recent um, album I have of Jan Garbrick, but he recorded albums obviously um, since or in between some of these um, with different permeations of musicians that don't include Rainy Burning House. But here's a Jan Garbrick group, Dresden, in concert. This is now that this uh, this kind of came at a bad time, really, because I think the band was uh, this came out in 2009. It was recorded in 2007, October 2007. Um, I don't know if the band was intending to do a live album eventually. They really should have, because the the Garbrick band had really live centered itself around a quartet with Rainier Burning House on piano and synthesizers. And um, for a lot of years, Marilyn Mazer on percussion and Eberhard Weber. Uh, unfortunately, this was this was recorded. And I have to wonder if they were thinking of of, of doing a live album uh, eventually, and and uh, and unfortunately would have been right around the time that Eberhard Weber had his stroke, because this came out right after that when he had a quick find another fill-in bass player. Uh, Yuri Daniel plays bass on this, which is somebody I'm not familiar with, but. This is the first time that, that Garbrick played with another bass player pretty much since 1978 when uh, he had Eberhard Weber join his group and stay with him even though all the other musicians around him played, uh, changed. Um, so this is Rainier Burning House. The only instance I know of where he's playing on a young Garbrick album that Eberhard Weber also wasn't there. But this is a uh, post-stroke post for Eberhard Weber, unfortunately. So he continued to play, and I haven't... Uh, 2007, so obviously Garbrick's done things since then, and I, I'm sure I looked them up and then quickly forgot what they were. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he's playing with them anymore. Now we get to, uh, I say, I say, I say the best for last, but that's that's not necessarily correct, um, because I, I I love his work, especially in Eberhard Weber's albums. Uh, but. Going on to the few solo albums that uh, Rainier Burning House recorded, his first two for ECM, recorded August 1980. This is this is beautiful. This is Friegwait, probably my favorite. I'm saying that with a question mark. Yeah, probably my favorite solo album. My hand is only three to choose from. And as I mentioned, because I did very quickly show these on my Evard Rebel video, uh, video, I think it was. Uh, a lot of synthesizer on this. Sounds really great. He had some great equipment at this time. Lovely, lovely sound. Uh, very synthesizer heavy, which I, I have no problem with. Uh, with John Christensen on drums, who he had played with in the original incarnation of uh, Eberhard Weber's Colors Group. So John Christensen is my favorite kit drummer in the world, so uh, I was glad to see him on this. And uh, two horn players, Kenny Wheeler being one of them. Kenny Wheeler on trumpet and uh, flugelhorn and uh, Breisner Hoff on oboe and English horn. So two very pretty sounding horn instruments. No bass, interestingly, a drummer, and then the keyboards, uh, acoustic piano and electric keyboards. That's quite an interesting little um, grouping there. 
and apparently won the idea uh, that Rainy and Burning House liked because back when he came to record his next DCM album in... I can't find a date now. I always have trouble finding the date on these, and then I find them as soon as I stop looking. Don't know. It came out in 84. It came out in 84, and I want to say it was, so it was obviously either recorded in 83 or 84. Uh, Rainier Burning House's next album that came out in 84. Again, no bass player. So you got Rainier Burning House. Uh, this is called Continuum. Uh, Rainier Burning House on the acoustic piano and electric keyboards. Marcus Stockhausen on trumpet and Freddie Studer this time on drums. Freddie Studer is a you know fairly well known. I think he played with Om that group Om, uh, fairly well known European drummer, and he's done a, a, a bunch of uh, appearances on on ECM albums. Not necessarily as a leader, but but as a sideman, he he plays on a bunch of ECM albums if you read the labels uh, of you know well the musicians that play on the album. Uh, so Marcus Stockhausen plays trumpet, piccolo trumpet, and flugelhorn, which I forgot. So again, you've got the horn thing going on, you've got a drummer, and you've got uh, Rainier Burning House's keyboards, but no bass. So he must have really liked the effect that it gave on the Free Voice album. And uh, naturally I bought them on CD too. Of course, I had to. How could I not? And there's that one on CD. And then the Fiesta Resistance. And one of the few that I haven't shown before. Um, as far as being a leader goes, um, I was kind of disappointed after 84 not seeing any more Rainier Burning House albums, and I came across a listing somewhere, uh, and it wasn't, I don't even think it was on an American, like an Amazon thing or anything, that there was another album of um, Rainier Burning House made as a leader. And it's called Shadows and Smiles. But I had hell getting it. And it is Manfred Scoof, who is a very well known trumpet flugelhorn player in the European jazz world. I'm sure he's German. And Rainer Burning House, just those two musicians. I didn't learn of, of this until 2000 something. And this was recorded in 87 and 88. So it was out there. It was released apparently in uh, 1989. This is on the Wergo, the W-E-R-G-O label, a German label. Um, that has great albums, but they're really hard to get in this country, and if you can get them, they're really expensive. Um, this is a nice album. Uh, Rainy Burning House, an acoustic piano and keyboards, trumpet and flugelhorn by Manfred Scoof. There is one track that sounds, sounds sure like there's a drummer playing on there, but uh, it must be Rainy Burning House uh, playing the drums on, on uh, the using keyboard samples. And it's incredible because it's not hard to play keyboard samples if you're doing a straight rock beat kind of thing. But the kind of freeform John Christensen, Jack DeJanet kind of thing where you're playing uh, a, a beat on cymbals and, and then using the drums to highlight that, that's a lot harder to pull off. And but when you hear it, I can't believe that it's not a live drummer, but apparently it's not. Apparently it's Rainier Burning House. Just that one track doing that. But it's very effective. It sounds very much like an acoustic drum kit. And I don't know if you folks remember my Gary Peacock video, if you've watched it, um, <coughs> where I stated that I probably spent more on w one on the Gary Peacock ECM Gamba uh, CD that had gone out of print and I found a new steel still sealed copy of it, uh, I forget, on some German site somewhere, and I probably spent $40 on it, um, being one of my more expensive acquisitions. Well, this one I found from, uh, I don't even know how I found this, a music distribution services company, MDS, out of Germany. I kept the, I kept the uh, order form that, could, that came with it, um, invoice. Once I found out the album existed, uh, the only pl I kept on bouncing from place to place looking for it, knowing I would spend a small fortune for it, probably to get it. Um, and I kept on finding listings for it with no available copies. So this, I don't even know how I found this MDS out of Germany, this online store. And I uh, decided to buy it in uh, 2011. So this was recorded in 87, 88, came out in 89. This is a lot of years after it actually came out. But I really had just found out about it. 
I paid 22 euro for this album. So, um, that's not cheap, and that may be somewhere, euros, uh, don't translate to dollars that well. It's certainly not $22 I paid for the album. It's considerably more than that. So this may have uh, a tie, and, and again, the euro rate changes, obviously. Um, but I would like to, <laughs> much, I wish I kept my credit card statement, um, because they, they do, do the translation there uh, for in, in, into, uh, into American dollars. So this definitely could, could be, uh, well, certainly, no doubt. No doubt it's up there with the single most expensive CDs I bought. Um, 22 euro is any, I, th I think the euro is probably anywhere from $1.50 to $2. So, so, you know, on the high end, it could be over $40 that I paid for this one CD. 57 minutes and 45 seconds. It's quite a nice CD. I'm thrilled to have it. Um, it's nice because, hey, it's only his third solo album, but it took me many years to even find out of his existence. And it's weird because I've been a fan of Wurgo, the, the German label. I have a bunch of releases from them, and I thought I'd seen catalogs of theirs, and I may have, but it certainly wasn't listed in any of their catalogs, which may obviously be partial catalogs. They're not necessarily in their catalogs that show every single release. Um, but I'm glad to have this. Um, I got burned kind of once again because I think just the other day, I think I went on Amazon in, in the U.S., pretty sure it was on the U.S. site, and I saw copies available of this <laughs> for, naturally, a much more reasonable price. And I don't want to hear somebody <laughs> tell me that I bought my copy for 75 cents <laughs> because I'll shoot myself. Um, but I know uh, this is a pretty obscure album, but even if you were just to go buy it today, you would probably pay less than half of what I paid for it. But do I learn my lesson? No. Because I'm always afraid that uh, of not buying it when I see it. Especially because I did hunt for this for months. Um, and no copies were coming up. And the same thing with the Gary Peacock album. Which also is readily available now that I've spent my 40-something dollars on it. Um, but wh what's he doing now? Uh, I don't know. Does he have more solo discs out? It's possible. Uh, it's possible that they're on even more obscure labels than Wurgo. Uh, Wurgo's probably not actually an obscure label in Germany, to be honest. Um, but he's, he's out there doing things, I'm fairly sure. I would love to hear them. And um, if anybody knows, let me know. If anybody is friends with him or something, please put in a good word for me. Uh, but that's my kind of appreciation of Rainy Burning House. Somebody, probably a bunch of you know people that view my videos may know. Um, and um, I hope it, it, it shed some light on something, something or other. And now you can all go and buy your copies of this album, because this, is the, this would be the one out of all of these that I showed that you probably wouldn't have, because it's the most obscure one, and I have my copy, and just know that I probably paid twice as much for my copy as you're going to pay for yours. So that's my rant for the day, and I'll be back, and I appreciate all you guys watching and commenting. Um, see you soon.